Said I've got a question for you. We all know that you can bring the heavy offense, but there are a lot of skeptics that think that perhaps you can't take it, that uh, you can't take the punishment that Diesel will give you tonight. How do you address those skeptics? Well, the st skeptics and all the people have a little bit of... Let me do this again. Oh, it's live, Hal. I'm sorry. Hello and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. And at the other end of the series of tubes and wires we call the internets is Joe, Crazy Writer. How you doing today, Joe? Why the hell didn't you tell me that Patrick McGowan was in Silver Streak? You didn't ask? Well, if you're going to be that way, it's time to ask the Strode. Oh, Lord. I know. You never see it coming, do you? And okay. I, I, I'm, comes, I'm in the thinking this, chair. This one comes from our good buddy and, and friend of the show, Angel Medina. Really? Yeah. yeah. Did you see the drawing that Angel put up today? No, I didn't. You, you, you should go look. It's a whole bunch of Spider-Mans. Jesus, that is beautiful. I offered him uh, $13.75 for it. Well, I've already offered him $77.13, so we're way ahead of you. So You always do that to me. He asks the Strode... Really? Goofy Golf or Pinocchio? Goofy Golf or Pinocchio? Yes. I prefer Goofy. And Goofy playing golf is one of the funniest cartoons... Uh, Disney put out, which isn't hard, because most of the Disney cartoons are more heartwarming and, and sort of, aww, than funny. Aww, yeah. Whereas Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers cartoons, those are funny. There are very few Disney cartoons where I laughed. Until Pixar uh, came along. I gotta say that uh, the, the cartoons later on, like in the 90s when they started re-imaging everything, they, you could see they went more towards the Animaniacs, uh, Looney Tunes thing. Actually, a little bit more fun. Not, not so much, uh, hey, look how cool we are because we're moving, you know. So, that much, I, I really liked, oh, what was it? Dana would remember. There was like a show, Mickey Mouse, House of Mouse, House of Mouse, I think it was called, but it, it was like all the Disney characters were in it. So, while, uh, like, Disney, Mickey was busy talking to Goofy underneath the seven dwarves were walking by. And then, of course, Grumpy made the comment uh, to deliver the joke, you know. And I remember the one we watched, it was like a Halloween one where the villains took over. And, you know, it, it was Jafar, it was uh, uh, Hades from Hercules, uh, a couple I've never seen before. And, of course, Mickey, in order to take back control of his house donned the wizard hats from Fantasia and I was like oh this is so oh that's a fun idea so it was kind of neat that they take it all and they, they use all the characters and of course they got the same you know when you hear James Wood you know laughing as 80s obviously they took that out of the movie I don't think or I, mean, I don't know maybe they called him and said hey we need you to make a, a laughing noise I'll be down in a minute well he shows up on uh, Family Guy every so often so who knows I know there was a, a uh, 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 George Went, who plays Norm from Cheers, went there. They were doing a Cheers joke, and they had him come in and deliver a line. And George had, had asked him, well, why, why did you have me come down and do this? You could have just taken it off of the show. He goes, well, you know, we, we really want to meet you. You know, you're kind of our heroes. We want you to come down, and we want to give you a paycheck besides, you know, so... Usually when they have something like that happen, it, I, you always got to stick around to the end credits to see, was it really them, or did they just have somebody impersonate them? I now have a, does Joe know? 
Oh, I like these. Not really. Joe, have you ever heard of the Air Pirates? Are you talking the uh, underground? Yes. One that uh, got Disney sued? Yes. Yes. I actually owned a copy of it for a while. All right. Are you ready for the Does Joe Know? Okay. Which of the Air Pirates currently works for Disney? <laughs> that I would not know. Bobby London. Mm-hmm. He was one of the Air Pirates. He worked on um, the Popeye strip, actually got fired from the Popeye strip for doing a abortion storyline, which surprises well, me that uh, they didn't stop it you know, when, he was, before. when he was delivering it. It's like, no. Uh, but he just finished up a job on the uh, Mickey Mouse show. It's currently on uh, Disney Junior. He did that for five seasons where he was drawing Mickey. So uh, there you go, Joe. Uh, one of the Air Pirates who back in the 70s did a comic book, an underground comic called Air Pirate Funnies, where they sort of stole the Disney characters and put them in adult situations. Mickey was a you know pilot who uh, ran drugs, and there was... Uh, the sex mouse on mouse sex violence and uh, Disney of course sued the shit out of them and they See, fought the problem it. Was, the problem was is that they actually used Mickey Mouse. Yes. Had they not used Mickey Mouse and you know called him Mortimer Mouse or whatever, they might have got they might have gotten away with it. But they got sued as Disney's want to do, and they were. Basically, what they were trying to do was liberate the characters. They were saying that, well, the characters should be in public domain, so we're going to do this to put them into public domain. And the lawsuit lasted forever. There's a really good book out that Fanographics did um, about it, but it's out of print now. And the other thing is, you know, it's like a 300-page book, and the type is tiny. So it's 300 pages. It takes about as long as a 900-page book to read. But yeah, Bobby London, one of the Air Pirates who was sued by Disney, yeah, works in Disney Animation. He uh, just finished up his job there and announced he's going to be working on a show over at Nickelodeon. And all I can think is, you know, for all this talk about how companies get mad at people, mm-hmm. they bring if you've got the skills, they bring you in. You know, how many people yeah. were fired by... Uh, were either fired or quit because of Jim Shooter, and we're like, I will never work for Marvel again, and then showed up as soon as uh, Shooter left. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. We we know that from wrestling. You know, never say never, because you never know when somebody might come back. Well, so, Hulk Hogan, by the way, I still many, remember when uh, Vince McMahon did months, months of making fun of Hulk Hogan. And then, uh, oh, Hogan's available to come back because WCW went under? Ah, come on back, Hulkster. Yeah. I guess they even had a deal for Randy Savage. They were working on a deal for him to come back toward the end of his life. But we'll never know uh, why Vince hated him so much. So how many issues of Mickey Mouse and the Air Pirate Funnies were printed? I don't know. I think they did two or three. Just two. And the second one had a black cover. Because they couldn't have Mickey Mouse on it. Because I do remember picking that one up. I The thing is, I've not read a legal reprint of them. Because there aren't any out no, there that you no. can find. Um, there are, however, scans out there. And I would never tell people to download illegal scans of, of banned comic books that there's no way to get. I would never tell people to do that. Ever. Never. So uh, we have not done a regular show for about three weeks. Yeah, yeah. We got We get the. Oh, by the way, if if you happen to have anywhere from a hundred fifty to uh, eight hundred dollars, you can go to that their eBay's and pick yourself up a copy of Air Pirate Funnies number one. I'm actually kind of amazed that uh, Disney does not step in and go no. I don't know if they, well, it's always a question of they need to notice, and I don't know if they particularly care. Right. They're probably sitting there, you know, doing what Uncle Scrooge does uh, in his gold bin with their profits from all the money in Star Wars movies that they've got. Well, I know that, 
Larry Wells, the creator of Cherry, Cherry, when he called it Cherry Pop Tart, got sued by both Archie and Pop Tarts. Yep. <laughs> Larry Wells, who was out at Burning Man, and uh, sent pictures from Burning Man if you follow him on Facebook. So, not drawing any comics, which is a shame, but he was out at Burning Man with all the damn hippies. But three weeks, Joe, three weeks. So you were on vacation. Yeah, yeah, we were when we last left. Well, well let's let's bring people up up to date. We we uh, how did the podcast? Tonight? Okay, I'll bring the them up to date. Problem. When we are recording, it uh, sports ball starts tonight. Eh. I, last year you were excited. Eh. You, so you realize fickle. you realize so what sports ball is going to. Uh, how, how do you say how, how it's going to end this year? With the Super Bowl here in Minneapolis. Yes. So, eh. The only and plus, and I it's have. not like when wrestling, when uh, WrestleMania comes here, when all the other small wrestling companies will show up. Oh, nope, yeah, there aren't be. any small football companies going to show up. Nope, nope, nope. No, the, see the 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 one thing that's going to be interesting. And have have I? Uh, there's a lot of things that have happened. I actually got. A new schedule at work, so I don't know if we if we shared that with our fans. I know I, I, I talked not. about it. Uh, I am losing my weekends, unfortunately, which sucks. Uh, so I'm not going to, you know, after 15 years, and I've actually been at TSA for 15 years as of September 1st. That was actually my anniversary date. I actually got a weekend with my last shift at Thursday, Friday, Saturday off, working 10-hour days. And, of course... Uh, apparently some Yabu in the morning shift was complaining, oh, we don't get 10-hour days. It's like, well, yeah, because you got to start at 3 a.m. we got to start at 11.30. It just doesn't work. So scheduling, of course, to accommodate this one person, and there were some other people involved as well, mix and match the schedule and totally created a cluster. So basically everybody but three people that had their weekends off got it taken away. Uh, there are going to be days where I'm going to come to work at 1.30, and everybody from the AM side that's leadership that I need to talk to will have left at 11.30. And it's just, it's it's going to be bad. Uh, my new days off, though, will be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so I still get 10-hour days, which is fine. Uh, as of the 1st, I start earning 8 hours of vacation a pay period because after 15 years of federal service that's kind of one of the last milestones you get. And I guess that's a, I, I'm, I'm okay, I'm, I'm happy with that I guess, you know, because it doesn't start till October so I'll still be able to get to go to Fall Comic Con, the One Day Wonder, October 7th 2017, out at the Minnesota State Fair Education Building. You need to get educated. And while we're sitting here, you could go to mcbacomiccons.com and not only get advanced tickets, which are highly recommended, but they're also slowly putting up who's going, like me, and your guests that are going. I will be. I just sent in my check on uh, Monday. Of course, this is like the Thursday after Labor Day, so it didn't move till Tuesday. But that's, you know, it's on the way. Uh, my partner Pat Gruber, he's going to bring some stuff. So, oh, he's have, having uh, another farewell sale. Nope, nope. He's he is on my first final sale. So, so it's my turn sale. now to have a final sale. Yeah, because you know I've. But we'll talk about that when we get to geeking a little bit more. So you get advanced tickets ready. I got a new schedule. The schedule's cool because I am automatically off Christmas. I'm off New Year's. I'm off the Monday after Super Bowl. <laughs> Although I imagine there'll be some uh, overtime op- possibilities, so I maybe. Oh yeah, I would imagine worse, uh, that the, the or worse, the airport the will be crazy overtime. So yeah, it's it's going to be crazy. Uh, and if you've seen some of the headlines out of Minneapolis, it's going crazy now because they're rebuilding one of the checkpoints, which means everybody's got to go to the one checkpoint. And, of course, those people who aren't smart enough to do what we usually say, get there two hours in advance, suddenly realize, oh, i got to wait in an hour-long line to get through security. But even as we speak, the new checkpoint's working, and they got this automatic bin thing going, which I, uh, I'm i not quite sure. They, they have it in Phoenix. It's supposed to help. Uh, I'm not sure when the last time you flew was, Corey, but, you know, you get up to security, and you have a 
They give you a bin, which, uh, by the way, doubles as a uh, litter box if you uh, – but uh, never mind. Um, so you take the bin, and then you divest your stuff and whatever, and, you know, you get that one guy sitting in front of you that, you know, apparently has never flown before because, you know, they, they say take everything out of the pocket. He's like, do you mean cash? Yes, everything out of your pocket. Uh, what about Kleenex? Yeah. Uh, keys, if it's something – Take it out of your pocket. So while they're doing that, you're sitting behind there because you've done everything you need to do. Your liquids are out. Your laptop's out. Your shoes are off. Your belt's off. You're ready to go. So you have to wait for this yabu, this jabroni, this hamstrung hamster to get his act together. And I say him because, we you know, women would never, ever do that at the airport. So, but with the automatic bin system, you know, you fill your bin, you push it into the system, and it goes and it flows with you. So... By the time you get through, be it uh, the uh, metal detector or the body scanner, whichever one you're directed to, your bin will be waiting for you right on the other side. Uh, the bin returns to reload. You know, you may be already on your way to the bar, and that Yabu may be behind you still trying to figure out uh, uh, which pair of socks he should take off. But uh, so it, anyways, it's going to be cool. It'll be, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. It's going to be great screening. I'm telling you, it's it's great. Uh, in the meantime, though, you only got one checkpoint to funnel through, so it's it's. You know, I don't know why I'm saying this. I'm in bags. It doesn't bother me any. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's it should be kind of interesting. And like I said, the the, the Super Bowl's coming up. I, I I'm kind of bummed in a way because you know there's all these little cons coming up that I just won't be able to get to. Uh, you know, matter of fact, there's there this weekend or last weekend by the time the podcast dropped. There's one out in Eau Claire, Wisconsin I'll miss. Uh, there's uh, there's one this Sunday somewhere. I'm not, it's it's like at a bar and grill or something. Yeah, Frankie Con. Yeah, which actually sounds kind of interesting. I may, I may trip out to see It's it. the fifth one they've done, I believe. Yeah. So and I thought Adam Vermillion was in charge of it. But no, no, no. He was just uh, kind of their uh, head cheerleader. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I definitely, you know, maybe I'll have a report for it. Uh, next week if I if I get a chance to go so but uh so yeah my, my new schedule is taken care of uh not as bad as it could have been uh, of course I do have people already they're fetching about the next bid which is happening next May <laughs> I, I went you know that I went all the way down and went screening on the other side of the screening room I was like I don't need to be on top of this negativity it was just too much so and uh, But that actually occurred the day I got back from vacation. Going to vacation, uh, you know, both Corey and I at the same time, we were up north. It was kind of cool. I was on the north side, the north shore, starting in Duluth. Corey was in mid-Minnesota. No, uh, you're, uh, no. You were trying to get to, what, Itasca? You wanted to pee in the Mississippi headwaters or something like that? Yeah, I, I, I didn't make it. You uh, Why? Uh, yeah. You were all you were all excited to go. You were you were talking about I want to go hiking, I want to go biking, I want to go thriking. I mean, you were just ready to rock. I was, but then the weather showed that it was going to be thunderstorms and rain the whole time I was there. And you know, one of the things they they tell you, Joe. Hang on, not, I, gotta, I gotta pick up my eyes. It just rolled out of my head. One of the things they tell you is uh, do, do not be around tall trees in in thunderstorms. Well, where would I be hiking, Joe? They're not that tall. Well, I'd be around the tallest trees in the area. Oh, well, yeah, there is that. But there, yeah. <laughs> so I could, it was like everything I wanted to do was outside, and it was supposed to be pouring rain, thunderstorms, and it's, I, I don't want to walk around. <laughs> I don't want to walk around in the rain for You're waterproof. What? Weak as water. I mean, look, you know, Chris and I, we, we went to Duluth the first day, and I got to tell you, yeah, we 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 kind of we drove up 35, and then we took a detour over to uh, this uh, cheese and wine shop that she liked to go to over in Wisconsin. So, but as we were heading north, I had what uh, is is you're prone to call a uh, EBE, an EBE, emergency bowel evacuation. Oh, and I, what I really thought it was sucked, some sort of military thing is well it, it is because if you're in the military and you got to do it you just let her fly 
And I was driving up, and I was like, oh, sweet bejesus, we are 50 miles from Duluth. I am not going to make it. And as we were getting close, we ran into uh, State Park there. I, I believe it's Patterson State Park, right along 35. And I was like, okay, I've been here before. Pretty. <laughs> I have been here with the girls. To, I know off to the right-hand side is a beautiful beach. Off to the left-hand side is a picnic thing. If you know anything about state parks, you have to pay a permit to get in. And I'm like, oh, please let there be a picnic area with a free toilet on the other side. And I took a left and... Oh, I was never so happy to see a pit toilet in my oh, life. I, I've never been so happy to hear that there was one, because I was scared that you'd uh, ruined the beach for, for generations oh, to come. Oh, it would have been nasty. <laughs> so we hopped back in the car, and, of course, five miles later, I had to stop again. And we What were up, you eating? I have no freaking It's clue. those donuts. It's those damn waxy nope. donuts, wasn't nope. it? Nope, they they uh, see it had to have been something before. I'm not, and to this day, I'm not sure what it was. But we hit the the gas station there, and I ran in, and thank God it was open. Nothing worse than getting in a stall and finding I was closed. So sat there for five minutes. Chris filled up the car, got whatever, came back out. She's like, "Would you like an emodium?" Yes, I would. What do you want to do now? I said, "I'm going back inside." And sat down for another five minutes. <laughs> Uh, you are just a party on wheels. I was a party hardy. I mean, but I, I got it after we were done. That, that seemed that whatever was in me calmed down. We got to Duluth. We were part of that same rainy system that uh, was affecting your plans. And uh, we didn't really uh, go around much. Uh, our original plan where we were going to walk along, they have a, a really nice beach walk. And we thought we'd uh, go visit it. And at, at the last minute, we decided, you know what, I, I'm going to visit a couple comic shops there. Oh, and, uh, and how did that go? Well, it was kind of cool. These are shops I've talked about in podcast past, but I'll drop them now. Uh, the first one, of course, was Rogue Robo. I can't even say it. Rogue Robot Games and Comics at Three South Fourth Avenue West in downtown Duluth. Really nice shop. Uh, Tons of back issues, a gaming area. That seems to be almost the norm for for shops now. You know, you got comics, you got games, and you have a gaming area to try to get people in. And uh, the guy was really friendly. Uh, I talked to him. His mom was there, and I said, "Yeah, yeah. Last time we were here, we were, you know, you you, you were pretty friendly." And I said to his mother, <laughs> "Last time we were here, you were pretty friendly. This yeah. time, however, eh, no, you're kind no. of a jerk." No, he was friendly, but I said to his mom, that's because my daughter was with me last time. <laughs> she ah. laughed. What'd you say? What'd you say? But uh, definitely worth swinging by. Uh, I picked up a copy, Will Eisner, Life in Pictures, autobiographical series from uh, www.norton.com, I guess, is the name of the place. And uh, intro by Scott McCloud. have not read it yet, but it's got a lot of his... Uh, Stuff inside it, so I'm looking forward to that. Anything Will Eisner is awesome. Uh, on the way out of town, you know, our our goal was to go up to Ely, Minnesota, which is about two hours north of Duluth. So we uh, we were going to go through downtown, and Chris went to Target to pick up some things before we get going. Because once you get up and the way well, you go through Virginia, there's a Target, but once you get up there, there's no Target. But I stopped at an old shop I've been to dozens of times, Collector Connection, which is up in Village Square, up on uh, Miller Hill, uh, 2220 Mountain Shadow Drive. Uh, I have a small shop, a uh, mixture of all sorts of media, comics, graphic novels, uh, toys like that. Ran into uh, Aaron. Uh, I, I can't remember his last name. You know me in names. But Aaron's a guy, and we talked old school because he was the guy who – had Pat and I went to comic shows in Duluth, and he was running them. And then we would go visit him downtown uh, Duluth. He had a store there. He moved up onto the hill. And it's really kind of interesting to see a guy like that still going. So we talked, and we, we just kind of bantered a bit. I picked up two things from him, and I'll talk more about him in Geeking. Uh, I picked up Volume 4 of The Devil's Panties. This is a web strip by... Boy, she must be really, uh, really humble. She didn't even put her name on the cover of the book. <laughs> Any Breeden. And uh, if you go to, I believe, devilspanties.com, 
she's still doing the strip. She's got like 20 volumes out. I've got one from my old comic book store for some reason. I, I don't know. I must have just picked it up because I like to support small press. Picked up two on the Ebays. I got volume four here, and I'm just, like I said, slowly reading through it. I also picked up uh, the second part of the, uh, the what, what is it, Batman Dark Metal? Oh, or yeah. Dark Metal. The Metal. And, Batman Metal. And and this is this is the one of course that sucked me in. And again, I'll talk more about that in geeking. So, I had a couple. I had three things to read as we headed up north. Uh, weekend was great. Weather was beautiful. We didn't have the rain that kept. Uh, we actually had thunderstorms roll by. We could see them on the south end of the lake, and you could hear the rumbling. Uh, the wind picked up something fierce, knocked over a couple of our screen tents. But uh, for the most part, the weather was nice. It's relaxing. It was great to get away. I wish I was up there now. Maybe we should start a podcast, Corey, Potting by the Lake. We just sit back and listen to the loons. and the... <sighs> So, anyways, came back. So, that was my vacation. What did you do instead of uh, vacating? Well, it was a long weekend. So, uh, what I did was I actually got caught up on some TV and movies. I got caught up to date on Twin Peaks which uh, made me very happy. I did a lot of research for the Jack Kirby episode that we did and uh, read a lot of Jack Kirby comics for his birthday that was coming up and uh, also recorded uh, the interview that's over on Panels and Pizza. I was a guest on another podcast, Joe. Somebody thinks that I'm interesting. As I would call it. Well, obviously, I mean, look at the listeners we got. Oh, they listen because of you. No, they listen because I get you wound up and ask you a question. I could sit back and uh, eat uh, cookies while you <laughs> expound your comic book knowledge. Well, that is pretty much uh, your job. That was the fun thing about being the guest on Adam's show. <laughs> I got to be you. I just kind of showed up. He's like, well, what do you want to talk about? I don't know. <laughs> Whatever you want, buddy. <laughs> well, drop his. Uh, drop the website. Let's, uh, so it's people can uh, go. Fancy Pants Gangsters. Dot com. Cool. Go over there and you'll see the link for Panels and Pizza. And uh, he interviews uh, Minneapolis comic book creators, and he did 146 episodes of doing that before he moved down to Iowa. But he's got a whole bunch still in the tank that will take him to about the end of the year. And he's going to be interviewing people at the uh, Iowa comic conventions that he goes to. And then he'll be back in Minneapolis in, at the end of the year. And deciding... What he does from there. Ooh, cool. Now, uh, of course, that just brings us up to uh, August, of course. Now, did, did you go to the fair at all? No, I, I am not a fair person. Oh, okay. I went, speaking of, you know, this is how much, uh, Corey. Oh, there's a little bit of rain. I, I can't go to the fair. It was raining the day Chris and I went to the fair. We went on the Saturday the 26th, mostly because we had bought tickets to go see the comedian Jim uh, Gaffigan, and am I saying his name right? Yeah, Gaffigan. Yeah, yeah. And uh, oh my lord, was he hilarious! He had an opening person that was, you know, you could tell the difference between a guy who's starting and a professional like Jim. Because Jim, I'm saying they got outside fairgrounds, and it just went nuts. I mean, it was it was fun. It was crazy. Uh, the crazy. First, get it, get it. And he, he even, you know, there's a couple times rain started dropping. He goes, hey. Is it raining out there? Uh, I'm totally dry up here. <laughs> when we got to the fair, it was raining. First thing I did, I find some ponchos. Chris was there. Uh, she was working initially at for the uh, uh, Chris Coleman for governor booth. Uh, you know, that's her boss, who's currently the mayor of St. Paul. He's making a run for governorship, and. She volunteered for the booth. Um, I actually was going to, but I could never get a time free. I was going to do it that day. So, I actually, I went out there about 2 o'clock. It was kind of drizzly, rainy. had my waterproof stuff on. I, I, you know, got there right inside the main area. And, of course, those of you who have been to Falcon or SpringCon know, you know, you go right to go to the education building. But immediately to the left is O'Gara's, uh, one of the big Irish bars in town. And they got the awesome spot. And I got there, and, of course, the friends we were going to see the concert with were already there. They were drinking. I was like, hey, guys, how you doing? I'm going to go say hi to Chris. You know, I'll be back. 
I get some stuff to eat. And of course, uh, first thing I did, I went, I got two Prano Puffs and then I got myself a glass of 1919 root beer. And then I went down and got myself a deep fried Twinkie. And then of course got myself a bucket of Sweet Martha cookies. Uh, I don't know if Sweet Martha cookies are elsewhere, but I mean, these cookies are huge. I mean, they're awesome. They pile this thing up with about four dozen hot chocolate chip cookies. Usually the lines are so incredibly long. People have been known to stand for two hours just to get up to get these cookies. Uh, usually from there I go take a blitz to the all-you-can-drink milk bar, but I was heading back to the, the uh, drinking booth. Uh, there was an article about the lady doing this. They've been selling these cookies since, like, 1938. And in 12 days, which is what the Minnesota State Fair runs, she'll make about $4 million. I'm like, dang. What, what, what could we do for 12 days that would make us $4 million, Corey? Um to rob banks no no that didn't, see that wouldn't work because she's been doing it since 1938 we, we, we get uh, we gotta sit there we, we gotta we million to dollars. start somewhere we gotta think something here so so crack. anyways the fun part about walking around the fair was finding a dry spot to sit so <laughs> and of course by about five o'clock everything the the most of the rain was gone it was a cool wind coming and Everything was dried out, so that was my day at the fair. I never did go back. Uh, thought about it, but uh, yeah, I got my cookies. I was happy. Well, that's good. So, anything over Labor Day weekend for you? Uh, Labor Day weekend was um, a lot of comic reading. You know why, Joe? Well, so we could talk about it on this here podcast. Well, not only that. No, I, I've been belly aching about uh, yep. DCB no, no. service not sending the books until the Monday after all of the stuff has been received. Nope, not for Labor Day weekend. They had this stuff so that I got them the Friday before Labor Day. Yep, yep. We got Box Day, and uh, and we got our previews with it. So, so, And you know what we call Box Day? Instant podcast. Well, first... Um, I read one of the books that we are to review. Now, you were too busy to do it, which is fine. Yeah, because what happens is, is I sit down and I want to do it the day of the podcast. But the books are put on this particular site for a set amount of time. Unfortunately, it shut down uh, two days ago. You know, and of course, I can't, when I'm at work, I don't have the ability to, you know, bring my laptop and read this stuff. So I'm just going to sit back and listen to Corey. Uh, it is a comic from Action Lab called Spencer and Locke. And uh, one of the reasons, what, what, what it is, is a comic, four-issue miniseries that they put into a uh, trade paperback, which is either out or coming out very soon. This, the, the pitch was Calvin and Hobbes meets Sin City. Joe, when you first hear that, what do you think? Well, I, I really can't <laughs> comment too much because I read the reviews that people left behind, and the, the, most of the review people, uh, basically, spoilers, so they kind of they kind of ruined it. It would have been more fun to read it and discover. You well, know, the, you find the, out on the first page. Okay, you so know, the, that, that, they're, they're off the hook. Yeah, it's on the first page. It's in the press material. And what it is, imagine if... Um, Calvin, from Calvin and Hobbes, grew up to be a detective and is living in a 50s detective novel. Um, his uh, pet tiger, uh, I'm sorry, pet panther, Locke, yeah, we is, got, we've already talked about lawsuits. We don't, we don't want none of that. Is still with him. And what it is, uh, his, the, um, what was the girl that Calvin the girl his age at Calvin knew? Uh, Susie. The Susie analog is killed. And uh, Spencer is trying to find out who did it. So he's back in his old hometown. He's investigating the murder. And through it, we find out that, uh, unlike Calvin, every every person in, the, uh, in his childhood was pretty much a horrible human being. His uh, babysitter molested him. His mother, uh, mother and father were abusive, etc., 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 etc. So he's now back, 
and dealing with these characters from his life. It's, it's a book that should not work, but it does. Um, I can't really call it a satire or a parody because it's not funny. It is basically taking Calvin and Hobbes and instead of Calvin's childhood being, you know, kind of typical, average, suburban, nope, this is a nightmarish childhood and everybody grew up to be terrible people. As a mystery story, it worked well. Um, the twist was something that I figured out early, but then let's remember I read a lot of these um, the thing that got me, though, the thing that hooked me, because this is something that could have gone horribly wrong. It's something where you could have just been rolling your eyes the whole time. Kind of like I always talk about, not everything needs to be an adult version. I don't need an, a, 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 a grim and gritty Richie Rich where his dad made his money selling drugs and prostitution. But the way this works is it takes what we... You know, it takes the, the the ideas from Calvin and Hobbes, twists them, puts them in a dark mirror, but it would not work if not for the art of Jorge Santiago, who not only does a very good crime noir style of art with a lot of darkness and a lot of shadow and a lot of really amazing character work, but the childhood scenes are spot on like Bill Waterston. Um, on our review scale, we always do buy, borrow, or ignore. If it was any other artist but Jorge um, Santiago, it would be a borrow. But because of his art, this is a buy. Beautifully drawn. Um, it's a one-note joke in a lot of ways. There won't be another one, and if there is, I imagine they will get sued. <laughs> <laughs> but if you ever wanted to see what would happen if... Uh, if uh, He's a gumshoe. If Calvin and Hobbes was a dark, gritty version, this is what it is. And it's exactly what it says it is. It's Calvin and Hobbes meets Sin City. The prose gets a little purple at times, but because it's uh, trying to do that detective style from the 50s, I'm okay with that. Um, so Spencer and Locke, I give it a, I give it a thumbs up. I give it a buy. It's from Action Lab, the same people who do uh, Athena Voltaire and uh, Ghoul Scouts. So the stuff they're sending us, I'm really liking. They, they've, uh, they've uh, won me over to the point where I'm looking at their stuff in the previews a little more closely than I used to. Oh yeah, yeah, they're always worth looking for. Speaking of previews. He said, finally getting to the point of this episode. I have previews right here, Joe. And you said you wanted to talk about the five things we were excited about. Well, we figure I figure five things previews and five things uh, in the box that we were, we were fun in. Here, I will start. Okay, I will let you. The first thing, and of course it's tough to just two to five, but I am excited about JSA by Jeff Jones, book one trade paperback from D.C., and this is back pre-New 52, and they're mixing green, uh, you know, Golden Age Green Lantern, Flash, Wildcats, with the younger generation of crime fighters, Starman, Black Canary, Hawkgirl, and Jeff Jones reimagines the world's first super team in these tales, uh, covering issues 1 to 15 in The Secret Files, and it was one of those books that as I was going through my vast accumulation of crap, I was trying to decide, do I want to hang on to these or not? Because they were fun reading. Very entertaining. And, and now with the, the book coming out, I don't have to worry about it because I'll just pick it up in these books as they come out and uh, put it proudly on my bookshelf. So th that's one that I'm recommending. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, DC's biggest problem, of course, with a lot of these reprints is you you got to know, they're going after fans like me because I can't believe somebody who is... Uh, Currently reading the New 52 would, would read this and, and uh, actually understand what the hell's going on with these guys. But uh, it's, it's on sale in December, so i got a ways to wait. Um, the first one that I'm going to point to is Michael Shaban, The Escapist. It's a trade paperback 
from Dark Horse, and it reprints the very short-run series based on um, the character. There was a novel years ago called uh, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. Michael Chabon wrote a novel about the early days of comics. And the character that the... uh, that uh, Cavalier and Clay created was the escapist. And for a while, Dark Horse did some escapist comics. They're here. I'm going to read you the uh, list of creators. Michael Chabon, Howard Chaikin, Harvey Picard, Jim Starlin, Brian K. Vaughn, Eduardo Barreto, Gene Colan, Scott Morse, Bill Sienkiewicz, Eric White, and others. Um, this also has uh, stories that were never before published. Six stories that were completed but were not um, published because the comic got canceled. There's also art in here from Brian Boland, John Cassidy, and Mike Mignola. I read these comics when they came out. They're very good. Um, nice anthology. And what it is, it's different creators doing stories from different time periods. You know, the They're doing stuff, okay, this is what the escapist was like in the 40s. This is what it was like in the 50s and the 60s. Um, Great, great lineup of creators. Um, Kind of surprised that it got canceled back in the day because the lineup was so strong. But, you know, Americans don't like anthologies that much. No. Uh, Joe, what's your next one? We have both sung the praises of I Hate Fairyland. From Scotty Young Image, uh, the gist is basically Gert, a grown woman in a six-year-old girl's body, has been stuck in the magical world of fairyland for over 30 years, and she has had enough. So the hardcover book is coming out, book one, and I have, I think, the first six in comic. I was going to pick them up and trade paperback, but I figure if they're going to do it in in hardcover format like this, I will definitely pick this bad boy up. Collects I Hate Fairyland 1 through 10, along with, uh, they call it exclusive extras. I don't know if that means, you know, Images has that that uh, companion catalog, Image First, that comes along. At first they gave it away, then they charge you for it, now they're giving it away again. And the, there was some I Hate Fairyland stuff in there as well. So this is going to be the way I guess I will collect I Hate Fairyland. So if you have not ever checked it out, there is an image first out there for a buck. You can dry the first issue. Otherwise, uh, just take our word for it and pick it up. Uh, Next one I have is a DC book. Commandi by Jack Kirby Omnibus. 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 It reprints the entire run by Kirby which was the first 40 issues. Um, one of the things, they have reprinted this before. They, re, they reprinted the first 20 issues in the DC archives, and then they reprinted them in the uh, different archive, the, the uh, different omnibus format that was the smaller. This is the big boy. This is all of Kirby's stuff on uh, Commandi. Um this is about the last boy on Earth. It's uh, set in the future after the great disaster. And there are talking apes and talking dogs and talking wolves. And a lot of people point to this as a ripoff of Planet of the Apes. But uh, Kirby actually had this idea in the 50s, pitched it as a comic strip, and it didn't succeed. And when DC canceled the New Gods, they said, well, what else you got? He pitched them this, and because it was so like Planet of the Apes, he said, sure. This is actually the most successful of Kirby's uh, 70s books. Because it went for 16 issues after he left. He did 40 issues, his longest run of a creation in the 70s. And then after he left, they did 16 more issues. Or was it 17? One of the things I find interesting is they've reprinted Kirby's 40 issues you know, over and over. The ones that came after, which actually by Gary Conway and Jack C. Harris, are really good. Which isn't the case for a lot of DC stuff in the mid-70s. But I wish they'd reprint those, because those are really good books. Uh, Joe? I love the original Planet of the Apes run of movies. Uh, There's been 
various books, crossovers, things like that. And Boom is doing it again with a six-issue series called Kong on the Planet of the Apes. And as you might have guessed, this is the damn dirty crossover event you've demanded. It takes place right after the original Planet of the Apes film from 1968. Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, help me, Dr. Zayas, and General Ursus, who has no song, they lead a small group no of one. soldiers into the Forbidden Zone to destroy any remains of evidence of Taylor's time amongst them, but to sur- their surprise, they discover a Kong, and so now they're on their way to Skull Island with Cornelius and Zero to discover the truth, but... They just may not survive. <laughs> so I thought about waiting and picking up the graphic novel, which uh, usually comes right afterwards, but I figure this one I'm kind of excited for, so I'm going to pick up the uh, miniseries. Starting in Boom, uh, 4 bucks, 32 pages, Ryan Ferrier, illustrated by Carlos Mangle. And, of course, varying covers. Uh, my next book is from Boom. Boom. And that's the hardcover of George Perez's Sirens. Uh, I, I saw that. I feel like I'm kind of smart, because when they announced it, it's like, ah, that's going to be late. late. <laughs> and, of course, it was. So, I think when the first issue came out, like, three years ago, and the final issue came out a few months ago, I remember not the... Not this free comic book day, but the one before, I picked up this extra-sized uh, reprint of the first issue that was, you know, shot from the original art and in black and white and everything. It was called the inked version, so that you could see the detail of Perez's art, and it's it's beautiful. So uh, this is a hardcover that reprints the uh, now mini series. It's got all six issues in it. Um, only thirty bucks for for it for a nice hardcover, and uh, it's George Perez. I have not heard anything about any other books he's doing. I know he had eye problems a few years ago, and I'm wondering if this may be one of the last projects he does because if his eyes are bad, he can't draw. I am surprised they don't have like a signed version because that's always a big thing, especially for these companies like Boom that make a lot of variants on it, because there's two versions you can get. You can get the the regular version, and then there's a George Prez direct market exclusive version, which has full uh, cover on it. Which which one are you going for, Corey? Well, I'm going to get the direct market version. Cool. Yeah, see, I, I would have, if they had had a signed version, I would have jumped on that like Oprah on a canned ham. But, I would uh, rather if they had an oversized version, though. That would have been even better. Because, you know, even on, if it's just treasury maybe, size. Maybe Boom will do that. Maybe they're listening right now and they're going to steal our idea. There. We're Boom. missing a million bucks right there. Well, well the thing is, you know, we, we've pushed Boom's books before with, you know, their stuff with Arkea. So, uh, and their sales boom. Damn right. I chose for my next one a smaller press title that may have gotten overlooked because, as we talked about previews, is not the the friendliest way to push books under red five comics there is a four issue series that caught my attention chasing hitler uh jay niz like chasing amy Haley niz jethro morales i'll just read it right from it as world war ii draws to an end and the allies surround berlin adolf hitler realizes that all is lost or is it two allied servicemen are tasked with the verifying hitler's death when they can't the chase begins Oh, by the way, it's not available in Germany. However, if you are listening to this in German, or in Germany, uh, let me know. I'll order a couple copies and send it to you, because that's the way I am. So I'm more prone to check out Small Press when I know it's going to be a mini series, And uh, I figured I'd give this one a shot. Again, Chasing Hitler, Red 5 Comics. Uh, next one I have is from Fantagraphic Books. Joe, I've talked in the past about the fact that they do not, do not um, do cheap, affordable reprints of underground books. Well, they're, they're, they, they're doing one, so of course I have to say to buy it. And that is Street Fighting Men, Spain, Volume 1. What it is, this reprints all of the, uh, well, not all of them, it's the first volume, 
but it's the trash man stories that were in Zap and other anthologies. Spain is one of the premier underground artists. His trash man series was kind of a adult action adventure book that was uh, politically tinged. And I've read read them in uh, Zap. I enjoy them. This is the first time I'll get to read, you know, more than just the ones that were in Zap. But also, I like supporting the idea of, hey, here's this underground artist. This is his most important stuff. We're going to reprint it. Also, one other thing, I'm, I'm going to sneak in under the wire so that I do have six. It's another thing from uh, Fanographics. The uh, issue of Zap, the last issue of Zap that was only available in uh, that uber-expensive hardcover, it is also available this month. Um, I'm not seeing it in previews, but it was on the order form. So I'm wondering if it was uh, brought in under the wire or it might be in the adult supplement that I don't buy. But uh, Zap number 17 is also available. So get your undergrounds. So you think you're a smart guy, aren't you, Corey, buying all the omnibus? I buy an omnibus here. I get an omnibus there. My whole compound's made of omnibus. Well, I'm going to go one further on you. I'm going to pick me up the Infinity Gauntlet box set slipcase. Holy shit! This baby. <laughs> Did you sell has a kidney? Everything. Well, well, we'll talk about that when we get to the rockin' eBay's here. Yeah, they. Uh, this this is the baby. You know, I've been talking off with uh, Corey on, uh, yeah, I've been chasing down an Infinity Gauntlet omnibus, and the the prevailing wisdom is that there, the omnibus will probably be reprinted as we get closer to next year's thing with the Avengers, but this baby has it all. Infinity Gauntlet hardcover, Infinity Gauntlet crossovers, Infinity Gauntlet prologue premiere, Infinity Gauntlet aftermath, Infinity War Infinity War Crossovers Volume 1 and 2, Infinity War Aftermath, Infinity Crusade, Infinity Crusade Crossovers, Infinity Crusade, that's two volumes there, and then the Infinity Gauntlet Companion, as well as the uh, Gauntlet Box Set Posters. So, yeah, I figured, Joe, how many pages is that? I, I, I can't even figure that. It, it, are, it lists it right there. 4,960. <laughs> Now, how much is that selling? Its uh, list price is five hundred bucks. How much is it through DCB service? Two fifty. I haven't even. I haven't even looked. I just know I'm going for it. So you're going to be the Omni buy. I'm going one better. Anything you can buy, I can buy more of. <laughs> All right. What's the, what's the last one you're looking at? The last one I have is uh, Alter Ego one fifty. Ooh, I always buy Alter Ego. Uh, this is a special issue. It is for Stan Lee's 95th birthday. And it's a rare Stan Lee interview with Will Murray, the man who uh, created Squirrel Girl, but also has been writing Doc Savage, all the Doc Savage novels since um, they brought the character, since they started printing new novels in the 90s. He's written all those. He's... Uh, written uh, The Destroyer, my favorite of the modern pulp series. He wrote that for about a decade. Um, let's see what else here. Stan Lee, Roy Thomas emails of the 21st century. Yes, they use private servers. And uh, a lot of uh, Stan Lee's non-Marvel writing of the 50s will be talked about, which is something I know next to nothing about. So I'm really looking forward to that. I know we put out a couple joke books through um, through the what Lion Books, which was the paperback line owned by Martin Goodman, and I wonder if he did anything for their pulp magazines. Although the rumor is that he didn't, but uh, I know that he did some joke books, and uh, it was those books. They were still doing them in the 70s, where they'd have some publicity still or something like that, and then people would write funny captions for them. He did a few of those, and he did one actually about golf that I've actually, that I've seen in the wild. But uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about Stan Lee because here's a guy you know, we think we know everything about him. The guy worked in the industry for 
since he was 17. Most people don't know jack about anything he did before 1961. They may know some of the stuff he did, you know, late 50s, but I would say the vast majority of people don't know what he did in the 40s. And he doesn't remember. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Joe, we've been going almost an hour. Do we still want to do five things from Box Day, or do we want to just Um, highlight a few? Well, we could highlight a few. Uh, The first thing I want to highlight is, uh, well, first off, I got uh, four omnibuses. Omnibus. Yeah. Um, (laughs) My box was very heavy. Um, I wanted, but no, I got five because I got the uh, DC uh, Newsboy Legion Volume 2. I got Boom's Planet of the Apes Archive, which reprints the uh, original Marvel stories from the black and white magazines, not the movie adaptations, the original series they did, which actually was used as the basis for Marvel's future history. They actually tied it in with, um, uh, what, Deathlock and Commandy, not Commandy, um, Kill Raven and the Guardians of the Galaxy and all the other stuff. But uh, the one I want to talk about is the Chris Claremont Marvel Universe book. And one of the things that struck me was how they, it's more a representation because they don't have any of his Spider-Man stuff. They don't have any of his fill-in issues that he did early in his career. It starts with his run on War is Hell, which, uh, good luck finding those. They're not expensive, but boy, they're sure hard to find, where there was a person who was killed in World War II, and he death was not done with him. So he would put him in the body of soldiers and in order to be freed from that person's body, he had to save people. So, and it's all set before World War II in in Europe. And the reason was because the the lead character was a coward. And because he was a coward, he had to learn bravery. Um, Then they've got his run on Black Goliath. And uh, the, the longest of the runs here is his run on um, Captain Marvel. No, wait, no, it's uh, Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel. Captain Britain. He did the early stories on Captain Britain. Then his big chunk of uh, Doctor Strange, where he started with issue 38 and went for into the 40s till Roger Stern took over. But then there's a huge jump till we get to uh, Fantastic Four meets the X-Men. Um, a lot of this other stuff is actually X-Men stuff, so there's none of his run of Fantastic Four. Um, we get that Contest of Champions 2 he did, um, a Kitty Pride miniseries he did, and Big Hero 6, which I forgot he he wrote. And it's probably the only place you're, you're going to be able to get that uh, Big Hero 6, because... Uh, Disney won't let them reprint it. They, after the Big Hero 6 movie, they kind of said, well, we don't want this kind of uh, connected with Marvel, because people will think it'll tie into the Marvel movies, and, and we really don't want that. So, But yeah, Chris Claremont is a person who wrote Big Hero 6, Brave New World, five-part miniseries. It's a wonderful book. Tons and tons of stuff. you got to the only thing I don't like is it jumps from the 70s to the 2000s with very little of his work in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> and uh, it even has his run on Man-Thing. So, yes, I get the uh, Man-Thing stories again. It's always about my Man-Thing, Joe. It's always, always about is. my Man-Thing. What was the one thing that jumped out at you from your box that you drew, were very happy about? Well... A couple. I'll mention a couple things, and then a, the, uh, I won't go too far. But Dom Simpson's Border Worlds came out in a beautiful hardcover. This is the science fiction series he did after his first run of Megaton Man back in the eighties. And now, fact, was it before or after Wendy Whitebread Undercover Slut? Before. Okay, I have to always work that in, you know. Oh, of course, I, that's why. I, that's why I mentioned it because I got a. a 
interesting sketch from him when I first started getting little head sketches, and it's of uh, Megaton Man holding a copy of Border World, and then they're holding a plaster to his face saying, retire, because it was a big deal that he was ending Megaton Man in order to do this. But he finally uh, got it all together to do it. Speaking of which, from Red Anvil came, Ooh, Spoon, it's the War of the Independence, a very slow crossover. Oh, yeah, that. Boy, it's been a long time since yeah. one of those came out. Yeah, this one, uh, I don't know when the first three came out, but I'll pick it up just because it's got pretty much any, anybody who's anybody who's not currently. I mean, I, I'm just looking through here, and I see too much coffee, man. There's Cerebus. I see Gumby. Uh, there's Madman, Tick, Megaton Man again, Milk and Spoon, Sippy, Bone. Uh, who the heck is that? <laughs> Somebody was some chick walking around in a very hot, uh, oof, oh, flaming carrots in here. How can you not love flaming carrots? So, uh, check it out, War of Independence. I, I have no idea when issue five is coming out, but the book I am drooling on. I, it's sitting here in a hollowed spot. I am, I haven't read it. You'd think I would have read it. I've been waiting years for this to come out. He said it was going to be 15 months, but it was longer than 15 months. But, you know, I've got the first four. I said, I've read it over. It's one of my favorites. If I ever get rid of all my covers, I'm going to keep this one. Larry Motter's Bean World. Hoka, hoka, burple, burple came out. Book number four in his Bean World saga. And this is all original stuff. Uh, one and two reprinted his series from Eclipse and what he self-published. Uh, there was a uh, three that was original. Uh, I think a 3.1 or something, kind of a miniature one that reprinted some stuff he did from Dark Horse and other things. But this is the next original one, and I I, I was disappointed because it, it didn't come in my last box day, even though it was out. I sent a quick note to the, the box boys, and they said, no, no, it's coming, it's coming. And I have it. Oh. Did you read I, I it don't, all at once? I, I haven't read it yet. I, I oh. want to read it, but I know once I read it, it it's done. It's it's like, how how would you feel if you knew you were going into Star Wars knowing it was going to be Star Wars as opposed to just another movie that looked cool, you know? So I, uh, uh, my precious. So, so he is, has said that this is the final Bean World story. I do not know because he. Maybe we should ask. Uh, maybe, but I mean, he might say at the end. I don't know. I would guess no because. He has said there's a season to the story. Uh, We've been going through spring. This is going into summer. Uh, Still got fall and winter to go through. So So he better hurry up. Yeah, yeah, he better. I'll give you 15 months. He's been doing this since, uh, what, 85? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 85 and he's only got four books? Pick it up. It's not a pace. It's an experience. So... (sighs) So that's the one I'm really looking forward to, among other things. You know who else we're looking forward to? Who's that? These guys, our sponsors. That's right. Here at the Solitaire Rose Radio Network, we have ads. And our first sponsor is me. That's right. Your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. I have my first book out with Dangerous Dan Moore. It's the first hundred strips of our online web strip worldwide news the story of the lowest rated cable news network and you can get yourself a copy with commentary with all sorts of extras with uh, signatures and everything just email dan over at lordshadowflame at gmail.com our top sponsor who's been with us since day one is dreamhost dreamhost.com you need yourself a website and dreamhost.com is the number one web host in the whole known universe just head over to dreamhost.com put in the code crazy k-r-a-y-z get twenty dollars off your first year how can you beat that our other sponsor is graze g-r-a-z-e dot com healthy snacks for a healthy lifestyle just head over to Gray's, put in the code C-O-R-Y-S-3-R-5-P. Your first and fifth box are free. You can get them weekly. You can get them bi-weekly. You can get them monthly. You can just order a whole bunch of them. It's great stuff to keep you away from the vending machine at work. Now, if you would like to leave a comment for any of the podcasts that we do, we'd love those. Go ahead and email us at solitairerosenetwork at gmail.com or you can call 952 Operators are standing by. 
okay, it's just a place that will record your calls. But we'll play them on the air. We'll answer your questions. We love getting feedback. Tell us what you think. Ask a question. Suggest a topic. Be a guest. Send us your stuff. SolitaireRoseNetwork at gmail.com. If you would like to advertise on any of the Solitaire Rose radio shows, you can. Just email us at SolitaireRoseNetwork at gmail.com. Subject advertising. Thanks. Now, we have been uh, very busy here at the uh, at the Solitaire Rose. The Solitaire Rose Network, Joe. Yes. Uh, not only are Dan and I doing bad advice over at badadvice.solitairerose.com, where myself and Wolfie B. Bad give bad advice to you, the listener, who writes in with your personal problems. And all I can think is, why the hell are you writing to us with your personal problems? But people do, and we give them bad advice. Uh, Solitaire Rose Radio has a new episode coming where um, they, they, I, can't, I can't even tell you what's hap- going to happen in it because I, I don't know yet. I, I've got like four interviews that are scheduled to happen soon, but I don't know who's going to show up first. Um, series in Review. Joe and I recorded a new episode of that where we talk about the next batch of issues of uh, Master of Kung Fu. And I'm going to be doing an issue uh, breakdown of uh, Mage number zero and one. And the novel cast has had two episodes. We had another one go up on Saturday, Joe. So uh, we're meeting our schedule of every two weeks over there. Um, and, and if you go over to worldwidenews.solitairerose.com, Joe, can, can you head over to the worldwidenews.solitairerose.com? On purpose? I mean, oh, I mean, yes. Solitaire Rose. Dot com. And, and do you see the new strips? I see that this site is now an archive, and no. that you have moved into a new web strip with a podcast, a web strip, and a blog. No, worldwidenews.solitairerose.com. <clears throat> I go for the classics. I haven't updated my personal website since in 2006. Hey, Mike, there's a new Worldwide News. There you go. Uh, three new strips are up by the time we uh, are recording this. I've sent Dan the two months' worth of strips, so maybe he'll get them done in a year and a half. Okay, off podcast. Yeah. I don't know if this is something, though. Every time, so you got that little calendar there? Yeah. Okay, I go back and I hit the fifth, and I get something weird that goes important. If you change any of the settings on this page from the default, blah, 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 and it gives me all these different things that I can change. Oh, that's lovely. I'll let Dan know. Yeah, and it it does that only on – well, let me let me go back to August. It does it when I try to get back in August. That's on the calendar. Okay, I'll let Dan know. Um, I can – it's it's the calendar it, where it's happening. It, yeah. If when I go to the uh, – Related comics, like when I go back to 141, I get the comic. Okay. So I just thought I'd uh, bring that up yeah, as long. Yeah, that's probably not a good thing. No, no. So, cool. And uh, we still have the, uh, the Scrabbling Across the West. Joe, do you know about this Scrabbling Across the West? I believe it's it's the multi-talented Dave Kofel and his diminutive life partner, uh, Stephanie, as they travel. Did I say her name right? Yeah. Good. You know, you know, I'm really bad with names, right, Cody? And they, as they travel, they uh, podcast, and they they let Corey host it on his site, so you can download it, like every other podcast we've mentioned, for free. And after we've done my plugs, we then go to Joe. Joe, we don't have time for your plugs. So thank you very much. Well, I tell you, some people did. Because as you know, while we were busy kayfabing those three weeks, I had me my big 50% off sale. Because I'm trying to blow out stuff before I get ready to go to fall. Comic-Con, the One Day Wonder, October 7th, 2017, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. I will be one of the... People with a 18 square foot out of the 33,000 square feet of awe-inspiring comic book wonderment. And if you go to mcbacomiccons.com, 
you can get more information. Some of the guests are up. We mentioned Pat Broderick, the uh, big big guy when he was doing. I know Pat was all excited because he was like, I mean Pat Gruber because he was like, oh, the Firestorm, do that, do that. Mike uh, Renat, Captain actually, Marvel, yeah, yeah, he's Captain done, Adam. I called him. I didn't call him. I, I got a hold of him via Facebook and I said, hey, I, I I'm excited you're coming. Are you taking commissions? He is. And so I, uh, I, he's going to do me a Supergirl. So I'll share that with the group when I, uh, when I finally get my grubby little hands on it. He's also I, one of the crazy artists who did a run of uh, Legion of Superheroes, which uh, probably oh, has yeah. to be, probably has to, like, really blow your mind if you're an artist, because what, like, twenty five, thirty superhero characters on that team? Oh, crazy stuff! So we're getting ready before. Anything that lasted in the shop, like I said before, three three of our listeners got a hold of me before the sale said I was interested in this. I was able to cut them a deal on it a little little better than half price. But uh, for the most part, I went 50% off everything, and I blew out a ton of stuff. I mean, I got rid of, like, Alpha Flight number three, which a variant cover from 2010, Avengers 3, Iron Man variant cover, The War That Time Forgot, DC uh uh, mini series from 2008, Sandman to Dream Hunters 2 variant cover, JLA World Without Grown Ups 1 and 2, uh, New Avengers number 9 during the Infinity stuff, Bizarre Adventures uh, 30 and Marvel Preview 24, which had Paradox in it, Amazing Spider Man 200, the original one that I bought way back when when I was buying, because of course I got them now in reprints and stuff. Marvel, the Avengers 1 to 2 comic book adaptation, kind of a prelude. Thor number one, the first one where, uh, well, spoiler, but you know, Jane Foster showed up. The current Black Panther miniseries, 1 through 6. SpongeBob Comics number 2. Pure Images number 5, that had a Spump Co. Bastards interview. Guardians of the Galaxy 1 through 6, the 2008 series. Secret Invasion. A couple one spot shots, Marvel Spotlight Scrolls, Who Do You Trust? Power Girl, number eight, Master Universe, Origin He Man One, Comic Reader number one seventy, Death of Stanley, April Fool's Joke from nineteen eighty, uh Sin Boldly number one one shot that Joseph Michael Lindsner did the cover, Razor Tour of Torture, nineteen ninety six from London Night, bunch of Sailor Moon comics, bunch of Futurama comics, bunch of Spider Man comics, bunch of Batman's Batman sixty six, one through twelve. Oh, man, the list goes on and on. Defenders 58, Adventure Comics 349 with Spectre, Madhouse 96 from Red Circle Archie from 64, uh, Action Comics number one, no, that not that one, the reprint from 1988. They call me Puss Puss. I talked about this before. I bought just because I like the word Puss Puss. Welcome to Tranquility Paperback. Oh, L50, the last cover, Magneto Rex, one through three. <sighs> well, I, I'm going to run out of breath just talking about all the cool stuff that we blew out of, all at half price. And, of course, for you, the listeners, it's not over yet because you can jump on my Facebook page, uh, listen to the ad that Corey dropped, or just go to Crazy on Facebook and check out the store. If you see anything you're interested in, drop me a line via the eBay system. That's usually the best way to get a hold of me. And uh, tell me you listen to this here podcast. If you see something you want, because, you know, I usually like to go cheap and do the good stuff. You know, Make sure I have the lowest price there. And if you do just all right, buy it, drop me a note, and I will pull something out of my vast accumulation of crap. Maybe not the stuff that I'm bringing to Falcon that I'm trying to blow out, but maybe some of the good stuff that I'm keeping. And I will include it to you just because we appreciate your listening. We appreciate your patronage. So, geez, with all that, I still got over 600 items on there, and I'm adding more all the time. So... Check it out. Uh, hello? Hey, I got nothing else. Oh, okay. You I thought you'd, uh, thought you'd vanished. Nope. Well, I, I could. I could go back and put more stuff. I got a whole pile of stuff here I'm going to put on eBay. Well, now we get to my favorite part of the show. No, 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 not where I lay down and take a nap and Joe runs the thing. It's yeah. uh, freaking and geeking. Joe, what are you freaking about? Ah, uh, I... I feel bad because one of the guys on my Ebays that uh, bought something, and uh, it was uh, the last issue of uh, Wonder Woman, one of the variant covers. Uh, I talked with my buddy Pat. For some reason, a lot of the books that came out right before the new 52 launched went up in value, especially if you got the variant cover. Uh, There was a... uh, 
Power Girl one that was expensive, and I had sent a Wonder Woman 614 to a guy. It was an Alex Garner variant cover. It has a price of 200 bucks, and he picked it up during this half-price sale. We actually did a couple, a little wheeling and dealing, and his fucking mailman folded the goddamn thing in half. You're talking oh. a $200 comic. Yeah, he didn't pay 200 for it, but he destroyed it. And I feel so bad about it. I've been talking with the guy. I told him you can, you know, USPS. I insured the damn thing, and USPS is, is jerking him around. I said, return it to me. I will give you a full refund because, you know, that's part of the game. But, yeah, he's like, you know, I, I'm just going to keep it. I'm probably never going to get another one because of the price. Everybody else on eBay has got theirs jacked super high. I, you know, I feel bad. You know, he's got 30 days to return it if he wants. Hopefully, everybody I send something on eBay to, I, I put a little uh, flyer on our podcast. So hopefully, we're picking up a few listeners there. So if you are a listener, uh, you know, and you've, you've listened for the first time because of the, the thing, uh, first of all, thank you for your business. Thank you for listening to the podcast. And uh, drop me a note, too. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll give you something out of my vast accumulation of crap. I gotta get rid of this stuff. Thank God Falcon's coming up October 7th. And I'll be there. Oh, yes, I will. Uh, other than, you know, by the time this podcast hits, we'll see what's left of Florida. My heart's just aching between watching the news of the wildfires, what's left of Houston. Uh, and, you know, even as we sit, I've got a lot of friends. Turbo lives down. My, my buddy Eric Jackman lives in Florida. The hurricane's bearing down on them. Uh, I, I pray, I hope for the best, and by the time this podcast drops, we're going to know how bad or how good it is, but it just doesn't look good. And it's, it's just, it's just heart wrenching to, uh, to, to just sit here and watch this churn towards you. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. I will sacrifice issues of my Ultraverse collection. That's ah, not going to do anything. Batten down the hatches. It, it'd be curious, though. I mean, I know there's been tragedies in the past, like when Fargo flooded a number of years ago, the Red River backed up. Yes, that was up. insane. And then it, the, was, it was in the winter. Well, what happens is it's in a glacial plain that flows north. So the river flows north, and it's going down. And when it melts in Minnesota, it's still frozen in Canada, so it backs up and floods. And it... Doing what it's going to do. It's geography, people. But this particular one was so bad, it flooded Fargo. It, I think, destroyed one of the comic shops that was downtown Fargo at the time. Yep. And then buildings caught on fire, and they couldn't get to them because the water was out, and, you know, there's nobody around to do it. And we've seen this happen in New Orleans and things like that. You know, it, it's almost a mini Tales of the Shop, but, I mean, that's one of the first things I ever got when I set up shop was to make sure I had insurance for what was covered. And we almost used it when Crazy Comics was formed because the weekend before Crazy Comics was open, there was a hot water break in the store. And most of the water went down into the basement, but hot water has hot steam. And I came into the store, it was a November night, and every comic was curled. We almost ended before it began. <sighs> but fortunately, I think by the time things dried out and we got everything going, we lost maybe $300 out of over $10,000 in merchandise. So it really wasn't as bad as it could have been. So insurance is, is vital, especially if you can open up a business. Uh, alarm system is good. To just, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm rambling here. Corey, what, what One do thing you, I'm going to add to that, there I listen to the news on my way to work and on my way home, and one of the things they talk about is that so many people, you know, you can't buy flood insurance from insurance companies. No. If you have homeowner, homeowner insurance, you don't have flood insurance. No. You can only buy it from the federal government. If you are in a flood plain, you need to buy this insurance, especially with, you know, looking at this year – this is the first time I can remember where we've had a second hurricane after one major hurricane. So we're looking at our second major hurricane in less than a month, and a third hurricane, Jose, is coming up behind it. 
Um, Minnesota was pretty lucky this year in that we didn't have major flooding, but it's already, you know, here it is, it's uh, the Thursday after Labor Day and the leaves are falling off the trees in my yard, which means winter's probably coming early, which usually means there's a lot of extra snow, and if it's a cold winter, that means that the snow hangs out for longer so that when it heats up, it melts faster and causes flooding. If you're in a floodplain, if you're in an apartment, get flood insurance because you don't want to be one of those people who's on the news and has lost everything. If you get the insurance and they tell you to leave, you could just grab you know, your pictures, the things that you absolutely cannot replace. You could throw those in the back of your car. Hell, what I've done is uh, scanned all my pictures and everything. I've got them on a separate hard drive so that if I do have to bug out, I unplug the hard drive. Period. Oh, That's sweet bejesus. Irma's now contains sharks. Yes. Well, people in Florida, get your chainsaws ready. This is going to be gruesome. Um, but, no, buy flood insurance. Joe, do you have any other freakings? I think I've freaked out enough this week. Um, the first of my freakings is uh, my Kindle. I love my Kindle. Absolutely love my Kindle. I have actually both a Kindle and a Nook. I have a very old Nook that I bought off eBay because it was dirt cheap and I needed it for the group home. And then I bought a Kindle. Well, Corey, why do you have two e-readers? Well, the the Nook is what I use for older books and, you know, stuff that I can download off the Internet. And when people say, here, you know, read this, I just slap that on because you plug it into your computer. Downloads are real easy. The Kindle is so convenient and so wonderful. And if you've got uh, Amazon Prime, you can borrow books. You can't borrow it if you have the Kindle app, but you can borrow them using a Kindle. So I bought a Kindle. Well, I was getting ready to read some books uh, over Labor Day weekend, and it started uh, not working. I plugged it in, and it wouldn't charge, and there was all this other stuff, and I tried the reset, and that didn't work either. So I ordered myself a new Kindle White. And uh, you're probably saying, Corey, but why is that a freaking? Well, as soon as I ordered the new uh, Kindle White, as soon as it got here, I went to uh, take the uh, the case, the protective case for it, to use on the new one. Take it out of the case, put it down. All of a sudden, your Kindle is starting up. <laughs> so now I have two Kindles, but one of them's much better because it has a, you know, it has lights and, uh, and 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 all that. So I've got a backup, but I'll be using the one with lights because I can read in bed. <laughs> So there's $120 that I didn't need to spend, but I did anyway. Um, Joe, I have British teeth. You know that, right? I do now. Um, so one of the things this year, now that I have uh, medical and dental coverage, I got uh, a lot of my teeth fixed. The whole uh, right side of my face. That's uh, You want to do, do a podcast with me uh, slurring my speech and full of Novocaine. <laughs> now so that would have been a podcast. So I'm working at the group home, and when the clients, it's like having a small child when the clients woke up crying, and the uh, wake staff was at the other end of the house helping somebody else. So I went in and sat with them and got them back to sleep, and it took about a half hour, and by the time I lay down, it's like, oh man, my teeth really hurt. But it wasn't the teeth that haven't been fixed. No, it's the teeth that have been fixed. And all I could think is that because the weather's changing, I'm going to be one of those people, ah, Fall's coming. I can tell. My teeth hurt. Yeah. Um, looking through the previews, there was not a lot from Marvel and DC in their trade paperbacks that I was remotely interested in. And this is kind of the second time, second previews in a row where it's, yeah, you're not really reprinting anything I really want. Which, uh, you know, I'm, I love the uh, Commandy. But uh, I've got it in the archives, and the archives I, are nicer books, really. <laughs> I'm not going to pay 150 for something that I paid 100 for. <laughs> and Marvel didn't have a whole lot, and they're collected either. I think what the the older, the epic stuff was um, Spider-Man: Brand New Day. Um, the Punisher was, uh, what, it reprints uh, Punisher 63 to 75 and a bunch of the um, 
graphic novels that came out around that time. That was not one of the better times for Punisher either. It was right before they canceled the comic and rebooted it. And the uh, Star Wars Legend is stuff that I already have in a uh, Dark Horse archive. Because Dark Horse reprinted all their Star Wars stuff, so Marvel's just reprinting it again. So uh, not, not, not much there. Thank goodness for all these uh, omnibuses, because uh, mm-hmm. looking like November, I, I might be uh, sitting around going, gosh, I wish I had some cool old comics to read. Oh, who am I kidding? I've got more comics than I'll ever read. And the last thing that I'm freaking on, uh, Joe Craig Yo. Do you know who Craig Yo is? I do now. I didn't Craig realize Yo. I actually bought a lot of his stuff. <laughs> Craig Yo does a lot of reprints of 40s, 50s, and even into the 60s and 70s of uh, public domain comics. He's the one who does Haunted Horror through IDW. He Yo. did um, the couple of uh, big Kirby monster books. Yo. Um, is reprinting Voodoo. Yo. Um, all this other stuff. And I like his stuff. I like his reprints. One of the things he does, he doesn't do a lot of the computer scanning. He actually takes pictures of the pages so that when he you know, formats it, it looks like an old comic. Now, some of the other, they do a lot of computer scanning and computer coloring and this and that, and it looks really good, but it doesn't have that same look of an old comic. His stuff looks like old comics, and he purposely goes out of his way to do it that way. And one of the things he's doing is he's reprinting a lot of the Carlton stuff based on the artist. So he did a book of Tom Sutton's horror stuff from Carlton. He's done books about Ditko stuff from Carlton because it's all public domain. Well, uh, Fantagraphics is still printing uh, Comics Journal online, which I had no idea. And uh, they, one of their uh, one of their people wrote an anonymous, anonymous crashing of his of his work, saying that it was subpar, it was substandard, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, one of the things that he kind of put in the article that makes me kind of pissy about it is, and he's ruining the market for our reprints because Fantagraphics was going to reprint some of that stuff, but Craig Yo's reprinted it already, so. You know, why buy it again? Now, I wouldn't mind if they were putting out something that said, hey, you know, we don't like how he does his stuff. You know, doing a, doing a review. That's fine. But this was, they basically trashed him because he was doing stuff that they wanted to do. <laughs> and he is kind of fired back saying, saying, um, look, I'm not making a lot of money on this. I'm sorry if I'm getting to these ideas before you do, but it's public domain. And one of the things that I think is really cool is the comic book community has really rallied around him. Um, A lot of comic book creators are now pushing his stuff hard because they're like, yeah, it's not fair for Fantagraphics to go after him like this. They, you know, they're mad because he's in their market. Well, that's not how you treat a treat a competitor. You don't use your reviews to trash your competitors. So, and it's something that Fantagraphics used to do with the Comics Journal, too. Their reviews, at times, I still remember where they did a four-page review of one issue of uh, Marvel 2 and 1, where it's like, really? You're going to do four pages of this intricate... Um, you know, uh, uh, academic academic review of a comic where the thing punches people. Yeah, they did tend to get pretentious at times. And uh, this is another case of that. And it's, dude, you know, we're all reprinting stuff. Everybody's reprinting this stuff. If if he gets to stuff before you do, just kind of say, okay, cool, we'll go off and do our thing. You've got peanuts for Christ's sake. You've got Mickey Mouse for Christ's sake. You don't need to bash not the, not on people. The, not the Air Pirates that we talked about earlier, but the, no, the they, real... they did a book on the Air Pirates, but yeah. they didn't reprint it. Well, that's enough negative negativity. Joe, what are you geeking on? Well, I'll tell you right now. It looks like you're geeking on food. You are witnessing a birth of a freaking, if I may. The birth of a freaking. You yeah. know, I, I think there was a movie called that. There, there are ways to do this. I'm telling you. I am eating 
my last Sweet Martha cookie. That means I'll have to go a little more than a year before I get another one. And I'm freaking about that. Stupid well, I'd make you bucket. cookies, but then we couldn't be friends anymore. Yeah, no, no, that's only if you clean my place. No, 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 the cookies were involved in that, too. No, no, I had plenty of your cookies. And yeah, but uh, when, last person I made cookies for. Oh, see, it doesn't work. Said for, it was a terrible, terrible thing for me to do. And already How made dare I make me. cookies? Don't. Hey, you're going to make me cookies, and I'll like it. I also we already ate all my pumpkin bread. You know, one of the things that we haven't talked about in a long time is my Ultraverse collection. And what I've been doing in the beginning, early episodes, I was always talking about it because Ultraverse is one of those properties that I just I don't understand why Marvel doesn't exploit, you know. Money. C- considering what they did for Miracle Man and for everything else, but I finally, as part of the, you know, deal trying to get to the Fall Comic Con, which will be October 7th, 2017, at the State Fair Education Building, mcbacomiccons.com for more info. Good Lord, you are a plug machine. You're like I a am. Bob Hope on the well, Tonight so Show. I'm going to be there, and I'm going to bring what's left. I mean, I have my Ultraverse collection, and then I weeded out all my doubles and, in some case, triplicates. And... uh so I'm real happy about that. I got everything. That I'm going to go through one last time and try to figure out which ones I'm missing so I can uh, hopefully fill those holes. Uh, yeah, which, yeah. which brings up a minor, a minor ask the strode. Whoa. No, I know. This, this is one, you know, we've talked ad nauseum about why doesn't Marvel work the Ultraverse, but there's another property that they own that they haven't done shit with. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about CrossGen. They bought all those properties and did nothing with them. Actually, you're you're partially correct. Okay. That's why we asked the Strode. Marvel did not buy CrossGen. <coughs> what? Disney bought CrossGen before they bought Marvel. Mm. And they bought the entire company and all their stuff for uh, one property, Escobad, which was by uh, J.M.D. Matias and Mark Plug. And they were going to do a movie. They did put out some books. And um, more than made up for the cost of CrossGen, because I think they got it for like you know, the, the buck fifty and some trading stamps from the 40s and, uh, and a dog whistle. <laughs> but they did try. They uh, did a couple miniseries, including a return of Ruse, which was by uh, Mark Wade. And uh, Joe, do you know how much the uh, fourth... How many copies the fourth issue of Ruse sold? I didn't even see it. Where Less were than 7,000 copies. Where were they hiding it? Uh, they pushed it. It was, uh, you know, in that Marvel book, it was in the front section of the uh, Marvel, pre- Marvel, Marvel previews thing. They uh, did a four-issue miniseries. They had Mark Wade do interviews. Uh, they did a trade paperback, and no one cared. That's why they're not doing anything with CrossGen. Yeah. They, uh, no one cared. Well, you know, if they drag it into the Marvel Universe, maybe we might. I know what well, they, they did two miniseries. I forget what the other miniseries was, but they both just tanked. Well, I know as I'm going through the Ultraverse collections, you know, we, we've talked about the God Wheel where Thor shows up and there's a number of crossovers with Spider-Man, uh, Nightman, no, night, yeah, Nightman, Gambit crossover. And towards the end, Loki showed up and even Warlock showed up. That's where they found the seventh Infinity Gem that created... Which has uh, since been forgotten. Yes, because everybody forgot about the Ultraverse. But not me. Money on the table, Marvel. Cross-gen Ultraverse. There, that's two more million-dollar ideas we've been out to this podcast. See how good we are? You know, I was loathe to buy it. Loathe. The DC Metal thing, because I mean... Metal. It was, it was like, oh, well, hey, this is all leading to new dark... Creations. I'm like, ugh, eh. But I read metal. the first two that came out, and it is metal. That's so metal. That is so metal. It's, it's and metal. Even our coffee's metal. It reads really well. I mean, for once, Batman is an obnoxious toad that's like, no, I'm doing this alone, because he's kind of like, I just want to make sure of my facts, but I'm going to need you guys. And, of course, other people bumble in. And by the time you get to the... Uh, 
the last one that had the internet on fire. And uh, I, I think it's, uh, it, it how, was this two weeks old this comic's been out? Three? I, yeah. I honestly don't know. Actually four, because I picked it up while I was up in Duluth. So we're talking it's a month old. If you don't know it by now, tough luck. But this is a spoiler warning. Sandman's Daniel showed up in the last page. Yes. And of course, if you're looking in previews this month, you'll see he's more he's more into it. He's got a, he's actually featured in the art. But that would have been so cool to read and not know. But after just reading the first two issues, I'm really enjoying this crossover. I don't know if I'm going to well, event. I guess is a better word for it. I'm not going to read the the other books that tie into it, but I am going to definitely keep along with the metal thing. And of course, the one thing we didn't talk about. Corey, what, what's your, what are you thinking about the Doomsday Clock from previews? <sighs> All right, let's keep going. <sighs> Have, books I've read. Uh, Here, here's did, Joe. Did you read what they said for Doomsday Clock? Here's the entire uh, listing in, in the previews. Oh, I didn't even read it. DC Comics presents to you a 12-issue maxi-series from the critically acclaimed team of writer Jeff Johns, artist Gary Frank, and colorist Brad Anderson. You, you have me at You have me at Jeff Johns. You are not prepared for what lies within these pages, good readers. <laughs> um, regular, uh, let's see, it's a 40-page comic. The regular covers lenticular. are 4.99. Then the lenticular covers are 5.99. Uh, d- 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 Someone needs to explain to me why when Marvel does lenticular covers, everybody gets pissy. And, oh, I'm going to boycott them because they're lenticular covers. And Marvel's a shit heel. And Marvel's fucking up the business. And Marvel's uh, not selling well. Marvel. DC's Metal. done uh, done lenticular covers. And remember the uh, second batch of lenticular covers. Yeah, I remember because I would go into Hot Comics and... Uh, they would have stacks and stacks and stacks of that second batch of lenticular comics to the point where they were blowing them out at a dollar each. Dollar. So, uh, dollar book. And uh, D- DC sales are lower than Marvel. So I don't know why Marvel is is evil and terrible and destroying the comics industry, and DC is great and wonderful. Two words. Because Secret Empire. That's I all. Well, I'm not, I probably will, too, when I get around to reading it. Anyway. Have I talked about the uh, book Backlund? From All American Boys to Professional Wrestling's World Champion by Bob Backlund and Rob Miller. Yes, you have. Good, because it's been so long since we've done this. I don't know if we covered it or not. Because I've read two in the, in that were really good: the Rowdy Roddy Piper book that is uh, son and daughter finished, and of course the Backlund one. And what struck me about both of them is that they're uh, they came from such horrible backgrounds, but were able to overcome and. Uh, Bob Backlund's a tough SOB. You know, some of the I'm, it, it's a great book talking a lot about the insights of the old, the old territories. You know, one of the things they wanted in a, in a uh, champion is someone who could take care of himself in case somebody tried to shoot or go in, uh, go again in business for themselves. You know, because back then, and I guess it's true now, if the ref sees it, he he does it. So if if Somebody were to actually legitimately try to beat Backlund, and he ended up on a three count. It's his fault. Whereas yes. he was Backlund was tough enough; he could get himself out of it any time. And it's a it's a great read. If you know, and I, I got it when I get into wrestling. I mean, his era was over because you know I was AWA, and then of course WWF came along and stole everybody, and then Hogan and company came back into town and started dismantling the S. AWA, or let Ganya just flop, whatever. But uh, it's kind of a interesting read because Bob was actually champion before I actually was paying attention to what was going on in the WWWF. So, and he has one of the goofiest moments in wrestling that I love dearly. Which, which is? Now, uh, I was not watching wrestling at all. This is something I heard about later. Um, Hogan was in the WWWF as a, ba- as a heel. And when he jumped to the WWF with Vince, he was being brought in as a face. But they knew that everybody remembered him as a heel. So when he came in, Bob Backlund, who was champion, 
introduced him, and the crowd's booing, and he goes, no, 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 he is good now. <laughs> He's good now. <laughs> and Backlund, uh. I believe, now, I, I, again, I wasn't watching back then, but I believe Backlund lost to the Iron Sheik, and then the Iron Sheik lost to Hogan. That's yeah. how they got the belt on Hogan. Yeah, it was a transition thing. You know, and they even talk about that because when Bruno Sammartino dropped the belt to superstar Billy Graham, and the difference being is WWF was a face champion. He always had heels going after him, whereas every other champion right. in the territories had a heel champion so the good guys could fight against them. And he even talks a bit about how Superstar was actually drawing money, and then he had to drop to Bob Backlund. And he did it, but he probably wasn't happy about it. And Bob was... He's still not happy about it. And Bob feels the same way, you know, because he dropped it. And he never got a chance to go back for it because then Hulkamania took off. So, but uh, uh, but he got it back in the nineties. I got to admit, it was a more interesting and he was back in St. Bob Backlund than I uh, actually had anticipated. So, but it's worthwhile picking up, especially if you're a aficionado. Like, uh, what is this? A wrestling podcast? It could be. Nah, nah. Other things I've read: uh, the aforementioned Devil's Panties, Volume Four by Jeannie Breeden. And she's on Facebook. She's at her old website, devilspanties.com. These are just fun, fun books, uh, you know, strip books, much like the aforementioned Weekly World News, World News Tonight. And Weekly World News, which is back, by the way. It is. So I recommend not only following her online, but uh, pick up these whenever you get a chance to. Uh, I read Copperhead Volume 3 by... Oh, geez, I love it. You don't even put the credits on the cover. Jay Fiber, Drew Moss. Uh, it's through image. It's kind of a Western in space. Uh, I've enjoyed it. The only complaint is, this, while this covers 11, 12, 13, 14, about four issues of the regular series, uh, it, and it ends on a cliffhanger. Uh, I, I, I want more. Faster, people. Faster. We're not, we're not letting you do a Tales of the Bean World on me again. Uh, in, in revisiting the past, I devoured The New Avengers by Brian Michael Bendis, the complete collection. This is volume seven. And I, is this it? It might be. Yes, issue, get up to issue 34. No, there's got to be more. I can't tell. Nope, nope, maybe this is the last run. Because he's also got some other thing. He's got the Mighty Avengers coming out and this month in previews the Dark Avengers. So more Bendis, please. Volume 7 of the New Teen Titans, which actually brings us up through the uh, the uh, first appearance of Nightwing, which I guess they're doing a hardcover in previews of. Boy, they really love that Judas contract, don't they? Oh, yeah. But this brings us up and through the legendary arc. Uh, what can you say? You know, I, I, I will I will give a spoiler because when Corey and I finally do get around to doing our uh, uh, dream teams for DC, you know, this is going to be number one on my list. Marv Wolfman, George Perez, New Teen Titans, or as they said later, the New Titans, and now it's just Titans. So, uh, I'm, I'm getting the omnibus fever like like uh, Corey is. I, I've got the Avengers by Jonathan Hickman. And and I found myself a cheap copy of the X Men Avengers Onslaught, so I'm going to break that by by buying those slipcase box sets. So <laughs> I'm not getting the uh, omnibus disease. I had a thrilling it's a disease flashback to my childhood when I picked up the Marvel Comics Digest Avengers or number two I should say, which had the Avengers in it because. It starts off, of course, with the Avengers 1 and 2 from the 60s. And I just, I flashed back to when I, I was first exposed to these stories back with the pocketbook paperbacks. And I would find them at bookstores as I was traveling across country with my family on vacation, sitting in the back of the Dodge van, reading the different digests that mom would give us. Usually it was Archie. And then, of course, I had the Marvel paperbacks, and I just, I absolutely loved this thing, almost to the point, or actually, I did damage it reading it, so if you got one in its mint shape, you got one more than I do. And they also reprint a couple of the early Spider-Man 
in Avengers, I think around three, in the three, I'm sorry, two thirties, uh, a couple Marvel adventures that I wasn't all that into. And then of course, Avengers assemble, which I think ties into the continuity of uh, the movie. But I'm just, I'm, I'm loving these digests. I didn't see one in this month's previews, but uh, there's three. One and two are out. Uh, number three is Thor, I think, that should be coming out pretty soon. Yep, that's next. And as far as other things, I, I actually saw the Wonder Woman movie. And we're, we're not going to talk about it, of course, because just like Spider-Man, Corey hasn't seen it. However, the DVD is out, I guess, within a week of this podcast dropping, so... We uh, hopefully get a chance to talk about it. I, I enjoyed it. It was awesome in the theater. We went on a uh, Friday. Chris and myself just went. There was nobody in the theater because it was Labor Day weekend. We had nice weather in Minnesota. Uh, we talked to the bartender that was there because the, the theater we go to has a full restaurant, bartending. Uh, she was telling us, yeah, if you wanted to come in and watch uh, the sports gama that's going on now, you could do that without buying a movie ticket. You could just come in, sit at the bar. You can order any of the food they have. They got a full food menu, a bistro. The theater seats are really nice, so we got ourselves nice and blitz. I mean, now we had a couple drinks before we went into the see the movie, and it was a fun movie. Uh, I had to get up, of course, because you know I got a bladder like a sponge, and uh, I missed a little bit of it. So we'll talk about that later when Corey sees it. Uh, for the first time, I did see the aforementioned Silver Street movie. It's a 1976 comedy thriller about a murder on a Los Angeles to Chicago train, which seems silly nowadays, but actually people could travel by train back then. Uh, Gene Wilder, Jill Claiborne, Richard Pryor, Patrick McGowan, who I'm trying not to drool over, Ned Beatty, a uh, film score by Henry Mancini, Scatman Crothers, just a fantastic film. We were just going through Netflix, and uh, it was there. So let's watch it. And... Uh, that was kind of fun. And after that, we we ran, we ran the movie MASH, which I have seen so many times that I don't even watch the main character talking. I just watch the people in the background or the people that are being talked to just to see their acting mode. You know, there's a few, few movies I do that to, uh, like Caddyshack, Casablanca, and it's just you've seen it so many times that you just you're watching. Not the person talking, but the person that's being talked to or what's going on around you, especially in an Altman movie, because there's always action going on. Just a lot of fun. That's the other thing about Altman's movies. I've got a few of his on Criterion, and they are very dense in that you watch a regular movie, and the two main characters are talking, and the people in the background are basically just window dressing. Yeah. In an Altman movie, he just says... Here's all the stuff you're going to be doing. I'm setting up cameras. And we're just going to film what's going on while you're doing stuff. Because he wanted it to be more like real life. And MASH is one of the... I remember seeing it as a kid. You know, you'd see the TV show. And it's MASH was a great TV show, but it was a very standard setup for a TV show. Mm-hmm. The movie, nothing like it at all. Nothing like anything I'd seen. It was dirty. It was messy. It was all over the place. And I, that's when I fell in love with Robert Altman's movies. And if you want to see one that where he does it really well, the opening of the movie The Player is one long tracking shot of the lead character walking through, you know, coming into work and everything. And everybody is doing stuff around him. And to this day... You know, it's like a 10, 15-minute tracking shot. I can't believe how long that must have taken to set up. It had to take forever because it was not CGI. They didn't do CGI back then. It was just, okay, everybody, here's your job. Boom. Yeah. And, it's you know, there, he, he just tells people, just have your conversation, just go. And it is it is pretty fun. Uh I think that's enough geeking for me. I don't want to be a total geek. Huh? Corey, what are you geeking on? Uh, well, the first thing I am geeking on is that, that Twin Peaks has concluded. Um, this was not the TV show I expected, but it's the TV show I wanted. It's um, A lot of people are saying, oh, it's surreal. It's, no, it's impressionistic. 
Um, David Lynch was an impressionistic painter before he got into film. This show gives you what you are looking for in that there's images and a story, but the story is loose enough that it's almost like your reaction to it. Uh, the final episode, I've read six different reviews, and they all saw six different things. They all saw the same visuals, but they put together the story differently in their heads. Imagine a filmmaker brave enough to do that. This was 18 hours of sheer, wonderful, weird imagery filled with horror and humor and sex. And he even threw in some stuff for the longtime fans. He wrapped up some plot lines and did it in a way where you went, oh, that's so nice. Plot lines that are 25 years old. Um, one of the things that I found very interesting as I watched it, because I kind of did a rewatch of the last eight episodes before the last two episodes were shown, and one of the things that really struck me was a lot of the people in the show had not acted since, you know, Twin Peaks went off the air, maybe they got one or two other jobs, but then they went on to other things. So these are people who are older, they look older, they haven't acted in a while, and it's very clear that David Lynch told them exactly what to do. Um, there are people who are saying, oh, it was a cliffhanger for the next season. No. It wrapped everything up if you're wanting to look at it that way. It's brilliant, brilliant television and well worth the wait from when they announced it, what, like three years ago they announced yeah. it? Yeah, you've been geeking pretty solid for three years. I'm surprised you didn't dehydrate with all the saliva coming out of you. Oh. And just just so well put together. It's not a story that anybody else could tell because nobody else would be brave enough to go, yeah, this isn't going to make a lot of sense, but it's really cool looking, and maybe it makes sense later. And watching it, you know, that long where I just, you know, watched the last eight episodes, it was picking up on little tiny things that showed up later. So it's like, oh, okay, he did plan that. Oh, okay, that's why that happened. And there was some stuff where it just, you know, it just happened and was there and was part of the story, but it didn't lead to anything. So, um, my Facebook friend and uh, a writer I have been a fan of, and I, we, I would call her a friend, Serena Valentino, who I first noticed when she was doing Gloom Cookie, also did the series Nightmares and Fairy Tales, just announced that she signed a new contract with Disney for three more of her Disney villain novels. So she's the one, if you go to the bookstore and you see they're, they're doing um, a book on Ursula, a book on um, Maleficent, um, on the evil queen from Snow White and the... Seven Dwarves, she's the one writing those novels. She just signed a new contract with Disney to do three more. And I'm um, very happy, not just for her, because it's such a wonderful opportunity, but these are really good books. And there is a tangent, because, you know, the animation and everything. Uh, so if you're a Disney fan of any kind, you want to get these books. It tells the backstory of Ursula. Why was Ursula the way she was? Why was Maleficent the way she was? So on and on and on. A lot like uh, the, what, what's the one for the Wicked Witch of the West in Wizard of Oz? What is that? Oh, Wicked? Wicked, Wicked yeah. Yeah. It's a lot like that book. Um, so highly recommended. Um, I have not listened to it yet, but friend of the show who was on the Kirby episode... Professor Elemental has a new uh, new collection out called Menagerie, where he has done songs about imaginary animals. And it's over on SoundCloud, and there will be a link in the show notes. And uh, I have already purchased mine, so I need to download it and throw it on a CD so I can listen to it while I'm driving. But uh, new Professor Elemental. Um, I think he's the only hip-hop artist I listen to regularly, Joe. Uh, let's see, comic-wise... I got all caught up on uh, Mark Wade's Avengers run. Um, I'm after reading it. I don't know why this book isn't much more popular. Have I, can, you been I reading? can give you. I can give you the reason why. Okay. Too many fucking crossovers. 
It got, there, it got no, stumped, there aren't. It got the first five by, issues, there aren't any crossovers. It got stunted by Secret War. It got, every time I turn around, there's a new event popping, like the Champions crossover. It's not been given enough time to become the Avengers book. And, of course, there's 20 other Avenger books at the same time. I mean, yeah, they're weeding them out slowly. But it was just too much going on. Every time I turn around, I think, okay, we're getting going. Oh, now i got to read the Champions. Now i got to read this. It's like, no, that's not the way, you, you know, so many... Titles were started in Secret You know, it seemed like a great idea. Oh, it all leads into Secret Wars. But then instead of continuing with the numbering, you just started over with new number ones. And it's Well, uh, the new uh, Avengers book, the first, the first uh, trade paperback, is a Kang War. And, uh, awesome. You know, Joe, you know how much you like the uh, Kang War that Busick and, um, and George Perez did, right? Oh, yeah. This one is smarter. Yeah, no, I agree. I bought them, but then, like I said, you, you start getting, you know, it crosses into Secret Empire, it crosses into this. You, you can't have a new book and cross over into three major events in not even ten issues. Not to mention you started it over again with number ones. It's, but, uh, it's so good. Yeah. I got yeah. all caught up on it, and it's so good. That Kang story was phenomenal. Yeah. And Mark and Mark Wade could write the phone book, and it would be interesting. Yep. Um, the next book that I read, I read this while uh, this was another thing that came in Box Day, and uh, Batman Returns the hardcover. This is about the first uh, what fifteen sixteen issues. It's by Tom King, and you know how much I loved his run on uh, the, the Vision. Mm-hmm. His run on Batman is just as good. Um, cannot say enough good things about it. Batman is in very good hands. And the uh, latest issue that came out yesterday wraps up uh, why Kite Man has been showing up. And Kite Man's kind of been this goopy character who just shows up. Kite Man! Hell yeah! Well, guess what? Uh, Kite Man has a uh, tragic, tragic story behind why he is showing up. And it's one of those things where he did a, did a whiplash on me because, you know, it's like, oh, I love Kite Man. Kite Man's goofy and fun and oh, shit. And it changes everything about, you know, what you've been seeing in the past. And I love when writers do that. I love when they pull the rug out under you from under you, but it's been planned the whole time. And... um so uh, then the uh, Claremont Omnibus. I, I, I'm still kind of giddy about the fact that I'm finally able to read all of these uh, War is Hell stories. They're, you could tell that Claremont was a uh, young writer just kind of starting out and throwing everything he could at the wall. And they're so earnest and so 70s. But the thing that I really love about them, one of my problems with Herb Trimpey is that he spent so much of his career drawing like other people. His Hulk was such a, a Kirby, you know, such a Kirby homage that I, I didn't, I never enjoyed it because it's like, hey, you're just drawn like Kirby and you're not as good as Kirby. In this one, it's a war story, so he's not drawing like Kirby. It's his own style and it shows that he had the chops, man. He really had the chops to do great work, and it's kind of made me sad that he spent so much time aping other artists rather than drawing in his own style. And now I'm looking forward to Claremont's run on uh, Doctor Strange in this book. And boy, it's, it's really nice to have a big old stack of omnibuses, and now every other weekend I'm not working at the group home because I'm sleeping there all the time. What's the R value of them on the buy? The, the R value? Yeah, that's uh, the uh, resist, you know, resistant value. Like, paper has an R, R value of zero, whereas, like, a nice big uh, insulated foam might have an R value of 30. It's, it's how it keeps the cold in and the hot out and all that. Yeah, probably like 152. So you, you're going to be great with your heating and cooling bills, too. 
Well, not only, I, I don't have to worry about that because I'll be sleeping at the group home all the time and at work during the day, and I'll basically just be home for like two, three hours to get a shower and uh, mix a podcast and go to work. So what you're saying is it's time to ramp up those productions of the Solitaire Rose compound keys and include them in everything I sell on eBay. Damn right. None of you people have cleaned a damn thing in my house. Uh, how am I supposed to hate you if you're not cleaning? Well, we don't want to hate a national treasure. Well, but I, I can hate you. True. Well, believe it or not, kids, you've listened to us blather on about funny books for over an hour and a half. And as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you like the most. Joe? I heard Comet the Super Horse is very contrary. Yeah, he's a bit of a naysayer. Oh, God. Hit my music. I've got to destroy that book. Don't worry, there's another one offered in previews. <laughs>